When the push for far-left ideology and identity politics in Western comics began, many readers found an alternative in manga. Readers think they found a safe haven from industry-killing activists like Comics Alliance? They are dead wrong. Welcome back to Thinking Critical, this is Wes, and in today's Signature Series video, you're going to learn about Patient Zero in the ongoing comic industry culture epidemic. Comics Alliance's favorite currency was hate based on far-left progressivism and identity politics. Even after the site has long shuttered its doors, former Comics Alliance staff continue to destroy the industry. They've infiltrated every major North American comic publisher and even manga. Comics Alliance writers are directly responsible for multiple years of market contraction, the destruction of Vertigo, and several organized harassment campaigns, one of which led to a murder attempt. Before I get started, I would like to invite you all to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thinking Critical is your go-to channel for quality reviews, open discussion, and in-depth analysis. Comics Alliance has a bit of an ambiguous beginning. The first post on the site was February 15, 2007, announcing the launch by Chris Dooley and John Anderson. If you read the website's History of Comics Alliance Explained, it was launched in 2009 under the AOL Media Network by Editor-in-Chief Laura Hudson. Either way, the site garnered traction and began its mission to destroy the comic book industry under Hudson starting in 2009. During its time in operation, Comics Alliance was led by Hudson, Joe Hughes, Andy Curry, and Andrew Wheeler. Under their leadership, the site became patient zero in an industry-wide culture epidemic. They unleashed countless activists like David Brothers, Chris Sims, Kate Leth, Jennifer de Guzman, and Kieran Shake on the industry and its readers. Comics Alliance took a hard anti-consumer stance based on far-left progressivism and identity politics. Writers and editors championed many changes that left the industry in a steady decline and on the brink of collapse. In 2012, Rachel Edidin, a then associate editor at Dark Horse Comics, penned an article for Comics Alliance lamenting geek masculinity and the plight of geek girls. Rachel claims geek is a gendered noun because every con is a geek guy con unless otherwise stated. She also believes geek culture needs to regulate masculinity very closely and fosters a more cerebral and less violent model of masculinity. Of course, this is all part of the SJW inclusivity cycle. When men don't lay down, thanking the Lord in heaven, women want to join in geek culture, it's a masculinity issue. She even claims terms like fake geek girl are a response for men being threatened by female interest in geek culture and the cost of entry for women is extorted violently socially and physically. Violence is an inherently physical act, so the idea of social violence is a complete farce in a form of Orwellian doublespeak. In 2016, Comics Alliance's John Eric Christensen wrote about Batman's fear of femininity. Christensen theorizes Joker has some effeminate traits, such as wearing makeup, brightly colored clothes, and flamboyant gestures, because Batman is a hyper-masculine male power fantasy and through normative history and how it utilizes oppositional storytelling, Batman is fundamentally stacked against queer and gender nonconforming characters. All of these ideas are viewed through Christensen's very narrow purview of modern society and his beliefs about GLBTQ issues. Does anyone believe Bill Finger, Bob Kane, or Jerry Robinson, the creators of Joker, had any of this in mind when the character first appeared in 1940? Of course not. They were just creating a colorful villain for Batman to dispatch. Oddly enough, the Joker was supposed to be a one-off appearance. He was so popular among readers, who Christensen and his ilk would have you believe are against the gays, DC Comics brought him back and he became the iconic villain for Batman and DC. In August 2015, freelance writer J.A. Michelin used Comics Alliance to call for a boycott of Marvel and attacked executive Axel Alonso. She claims she watched Marvel disrespect and disregard marginalized voices when they hired Tim Seeley and Logan Fairber, two white creators, for a Blade series. J.A. even explained, I have no reason to think either creator will do a bad job on this book, but was disappointed one of Marvel's most prominent black heroes would be handed to white people yet again. She was even cheeky enough to pre-lecture readers how excluding writers from projects based solely on race was not, in fact, a racist act. 
She then chastised Marvel executives for being tone deaf with their hip hop variant covers. She railed on about cultural appropriation and corporate America profiting off black culture. She characterized Marvel EIC Axel Alonso, one of the most far left executives in comics at the time, as unspeakably condescending and horrendously dismissive for correctly characterizing the outcry as a small but very loud contingent. Marvel Comics bent the knee and quietly canceled Seeley's Blade series. They began casting writers based on the surface traits and sexual orientation of the characters rather than the talents of the creators. Marvel Comics even phased out traditional white male superheroes Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, and Hulk, replacing them with new diverse versions. This was during the height of the comic movie boom, and interest in the original characters was at an all-time high. Nobody knows just how many new readers went to a comic shop only to find their favorite MCU character excommunicated to appease agenda-driven sites like Comics Alliance. We do know these changes started a downward spiral of multiple years of market contraction. The loss of thousands of comic book readers eventually forced the closure of hundreds of comic shops. After going all in on a more diverse character lineup, Marvel Comics sales plummeted. In a March 2017 interview with ICV2, Marvel VP of Sales David Gabriel said, What we heard was people didn't want any more diversity. And we saw the sales of any character that was diverse, any character that was new, our female characters, anything that was not core Marvel character, people were turning their nose up against. Gabriel committed the cardinal sin of countering the feelings of a very small minority of industry activists with actual sales data and customer feedback. The backlash was harsh and swift. Activist bloggers lamented the impending doom of all female superheroes and heroes of color. Comic books already featured female superheroes since 1940 and minority superheroes since 1966. Agenda-driven actors never let facts ruin a good narrative. Within a day of the interview, Mr. Gabriel tucked tail and changed his tune. He said, and let me be clear, our heroes are not going anywhere. We are proud and excited to keep introducing unique characters that reflect new voices and new experiences into the Marvel Universe and pair them with our iconic heroes. His moment of honesty hadn't been sanctioned by the higher-ups, but it was clear Marvel Comics was aware acquiescing to Comics Alliance and other activists was costing them in dollars and reputation with customers and retailers. These three examples aren't even the tip of the iceberg. The Comics Alliance archives are full of far more hateful rhetoric over far left progressivism and identity politics than one man can consume. When the site closed its doors in 2017, few comics readers shed a tear. Comics Alliance was patient zero in an industry-wide epidemic of brand activism aimed to promote far-left propaganda and identity politics over entertainment. It's hard to fully quantify the full extent of damage Comics Alliance levied on the industry, but Comics Alliance left it in far worse shape than when it arrived. Unfortunately, Comics Alliance continues to damage the industry long after its demise. Comics Alliance's ultimate legacy are the far-left activists who used the site as a stepping stone to positions of influence within the industry to infect and kill it. Many of Comics Alliance's staff like David Brothers, Andy Corey, and Joe Hughes attained leadership positions within the comics industry with overwhelmingly disastrous results. David Brothers is without a doubt positioned to inflict the most damage. In 2013, Brothers left Comics Alliance and was hired as content manager at Image Comics. His responsibilities included deciding what submissions were picked up for publishing through Image. Not coincidentally, within 12 months of David's arrival to the submission process, Image stopped being the it publisher of the double aughts. Image Comics' only breakout book during his stint with the company was Kieran Gillen's Wicked Divine. Some label Brothers' work prior to Image Comics as race blogger, which bothers him. When the Comics Journal asked why it got under his skin, he explained, while it was technically true, it wasn't actually true. He later explained, he left Portland because, I thought that life under white supremacy was tough, but I vastly underestimated life under Trump. And Portland is a liberal city, sure, but I've never felt as aware of being black as I was when I lived there. Visitors to his abandoned fourth letter blog see the words of a man obsessed with race. When the push for far-left ideology 
and identity politics in Western comics began, many readers found an alternative in manga. Manga is blowing up, experiencing tremendous growth in Western markets. Readers think they found a safe haven from industry-killing activists like Comics Alliance? They are dead wrong. David Brothers left Image and joined Viz Media as editor in 2017. Viz Media is one of the largest publishers of English translated manga in the world and the largest publisher of graphic novels in America. They publish Weekly Shonen Jump, the most popular manga magazine in the world. Not surprisingly, Anime Gate is heating up since Brothers' arrival. The controversy is fueled by complaints over translations becoming more PC. Expect to hear many more complaints about manga translations moving forward. Brothers is already ruining the English translated manga market with its far-left progressivism and identity politics. Former Comics Alliance EICs Andy Corey and Joe Hughes also hold leadership positions in the industry. Corey was hired as DC Comics editor in 2015. He recently filled DC Comics' vertical line with far-left ideology and identity politics, killing its 25th anniversary relaunch. Joe Hughes joined IDW Publishing in 2017. IDW Publishing began hemorrhaging money and readers when they focused their brand on far-left politics. Parent company IDW Media are looking to sell it or find new capital as of March 2019. Many of the Comics Alliance staff have created indie books focused on far-left politics, but a few have landed work with the big two, including Kate Leth and Chris Sims. Kate Leth is a part-time artist and full-time online instigator known for her Cater Die series at Comics Alliance. Leth's reputation is to make every established character she works with as uncomfortably gay as possible and is completely insufferable. Leth got work at Marvel riding on Hellcat but couldn't hack it. In spite of these setbacks, she still manages to come off as a narcissistic parasite. Despite being a card-carrying feminist, Kate began tweeting about being in a relationship with a married man who died of colon cancer in 2018. She quickly deleted the tweets, but it was too late. Internet detectives already pieced the story together. The man was identified as a married father of three. Nowadays, she's mostly an online agitator. Despite writing for Boom Studios and Marvel Comics in the past, her Western comics work dried up. Follow Kate on Twitter, and you'll find her busy calling James Wood a shitbag. She's still on a mission to make every comic character gay or bi, especially MCU characters. Leth currently works at Crunchyroll, the American distributor, publisher, and licensing company focused on streaming anime, manga, and drama. In 2014, Marvel editor Jordan White approached Chris Sims to write for the upcoming Secret Wars event. Chris and writing partner Chad Bowers created X-Men 92, receiving middling reviews and declining sales. He also wrote a handful of graphic novels, most notably Deadpool Bad Blood, with Deadpool creator Rob Liefeld on art. Sims and Bowers also got work with Dynamite Entertainment, but their gigs dried up, likely due to Sims' cyberbullying of former DC Comics editor Valerie Durazio while at Comics Alliance. The majority of Comics Alliance's staff simply moved to other websites. The likes of Laura Hudson, Andrew Wheeler, Jennifer de Guzman, and Heidi McDonald have moved on but still push their far-left views on the industry. Comics Alliance writer Jennifer de Guzman may not have the industry cloud of David Brothers or Andy Curry, but she's just as dangerous. She worked in sales, public relations, and marketing at Image Comics, and has writing credits at Publishers Weekly and Teen Vogue. De Guzman ignited one of the most heinous online harassment campaigns I've ever witnessed, and it ended in attempted murder. On 26 August, de Guzman started calling out Alterna Comics founder and publisher Peter Semetti for retweeting and thanking customers using the Move the Needle hashtag. The hashtag is commonly used by members of Comicsgate, a consumer movement aimed at removing ideological propaganda from comics, preserving hero legacies, and demanding decent behavior from professionals in the comic book industry. Alterna is a small indie publisher run out of Peter's apartment with no employees and thanks all fans for buying and posting pics of their books on social media. Soon, Alterna creators were criticizing Peter with a few teams leaving the publisher. CBR.com published an article claiming Peter Semetti forced letterer Micah Myers off an Alterna series for using a blockbot. Blockbots are a direct violation of Alterna Comics' social media policy. Peter claims Despite the violation, he offered to remove Micah from Twitter promotions for the book and let Myers remain on the team. 
According to Samedi, Micah and series creator Dave Swartz came to an agreement and Myers left the series. In the end, Alterna lost multiple creative teams and Smeddy was targeted for days for thanking customers and his social media policy. Smeddy thought he would lose his business and suffered suicidal thoughts from the ordeal. Unfortunately, the worst was still to come. The harassment of Peter Smeddy and Alterna Comics following de Guzman's online attacks never truly stopped. He was labeled an alt-right Nazi for refusing to disavow his own customers. Peter Smeddy is Asian American, but facts mean nothing to far-left zealots. Things went to a whole new level in mid-February. During a live stream on YouTube, police arrived at Smeddy's apartment with guns drawn after a 911 call claiming he attacked his girlfriend with a knife. What should have been a minor disagreement over comics escalated into attempted murder by swatting. De Guzman never apologized or showed any concern over the attempted murder. Former Comics Alliance EIC Andrew Wheeler is now a writer at Sci-Fi Wire and publishes queer comics and fiction like Freelance and The Twilight Prince. Despite more GLBTQ representation in comics than ever, Wheeler holds a very rigid definition of what successful representation looks like. In a 2015 New York Times interview, Andrew Wheeler said, We need to get from some to enough, and really, we'll know we've achieved success when Captain America can have a boyfriend and Wonder Woman can have a girlfriend. For queer representation in superhero comics, that's what success looks like. Queer representation can only be a success when historically significant characters who have always been straight are gay. Wonder Woman officiating gay weddings was never enough. Wonder Woman needs to be lesbian, bisexual, or transgender herself. This is a direct quote from the former EIC of Comics Alliance. They were never interested in quality stories or characters in comics. Comics Alliance was only interested in using beloved characters with decades of history to push far-left progressivism and identity politics. Former EIC and Comics Alliance founder Laura Hudson and writer Heidi McDonald also have significant presence in online comics culture. Hudson served as editor at The Verge and Wired and penned articles for The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, Slate, 538, Time, BBC, Vulture, Complex, and The LA Times. McDonald's been online disparaging comic book readers as toxic for over a decade now. She's a former DC Comics Vertigo editor, founder and EIC of Comics Beat, and has written for Publishers Weekly. Comics Beat was acquired by syndicated comics Lion Forge Comics sister company in 2017. I need to address former Comics Alliance writer Kieran Shake. He isn't an industry leader or professional creator and carries no influence in the industry or with readers. Comics readers affectionately call Kieran Sandwich Boy after e-bagging for sandwich money after a night out in London seeing a production of Hamilton. The former CBR and Polygon writer has a reputation for constant e-bagging and even launched an emergency GoFundMe campaign for rent money. In a bit of poetic justice, former DC Comics artist Ethan Van Skyver pointed out Shake tweeted about his upcoming move a month prior and was lying. Beginning in July 2017, Sandwich Boy made it his personal mission to get Van Skyver fired from DC Comics for supporting Donald Trump's successful presidential campaign. Kieran constantly refers to EBS as a Nazi and promised to continue the campaign. Van Skyver vigorously denied the claim, stating, These people who spread these images and claim that I'm a Nazi are liars. They are lying, flat out. They are liars who wish this industry wasn't tolerant of people who do not share their partisan political views. In May 2017, Shake launched a Kickstarter campaign for his Mossy No. 1 comic with transgender artist Tracy Shepard. Over nine months after the successful campaign completed, Shepard took to Tumblr to offer details of her experience. It's been about nine and a half months since the Kickstarter ended, and as far as I know, there are still outstanding backer rewards that have never been fulfilled. I myself never received a copy of my own book, and I still haven't been paid my share of the money. She also claims Kieran ignored her request for travel expenses, and she missed a friend's wedding. Comics Alliance was a destructive force during its time, but nothing could have prepared the industry for the afterlife. Comics Alliance's acolytes have destroyed DC Comics Vertigo, fundamentally altered Marvel for the worse, led countless harassment campaigns, 
one of which ended in a murder attempt. The comics industry is on the verge of collapse, and many of the current issues can be traced to the day Comics Alliance began spewing its plague on the industry. If you're still here, thank you very much, and I invite you to follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Wes underscore from underscore TC. I talk comics and movies nearly every day and post comic book recommendations for books I don't review on the channel weekly. If you follow me, shout me out in a tweet and let me know so I can follow you back. I love talking comics and pop culture and want to interact with you there as well.